The Age of Voltaire, Chapter 7, The Germany of Bach, 1715 through 1756, Part 1, The German Scene. It was not to be expected that Voltaire, as he passed through Germany, could discipline his volatile Parisian mind to an appreciation of German bodies, features, manners, speech, Gothic letters, music, letters, and art. He had probably never heard of Johann Sebastian Bach, who died on July 18, 1750, 18 days after Voltaire reached Berlin, and presumably he had not seen Hume's description of Germany in 1748 as, quote, a fine country full of industrious, honest people. Were it united, it would be the greatest power, dot, 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 in the world, end quote. It was fortunate for France and England that these viral folk, numbering then some 20 millions, were still divided into more than 300 practically independent states, each with its sovereign prince, its own court, policy, army coinage, religion, and dress, all in various stages of economic and cultural development, the whole agreeing only in language, music, and art. 63 of the principalities, including Cologne, Hildensheim, Mainz, Trier, Speyer, Wurzenberg, were ruled by archbishops, bishops, or abbots. 51 cities, chiefly Hamburg, Bremen, Mosburg, Osberg, Nuremberg, Ulm, and Frankfurt am Main, were free, i.e. loosely subject like the princes, to the head of the Holy Roman Empire. Outside of Saxony and Bavaria, most of the German land was cultivated by serfs legally bound to the soil they tilled and subject to nearly all the old feudal dues. As late as 1750, of the 8,000 peasants in the bishopric of Hildensheim, 45,000 were serfs. Class divisions were sharp, but they were so mortized in time that the commonality accepted them with very little complaint, and they were mitigated by a greater survival and honoring of seniorial obligations to protect the peasant in misfortune, to care for him in sickness and old age, to look after widows and orphans, and to maintain order and peace. The Junker landlords in Prussia distinguished themselves by competent management of their domains and their quick adoption of improved agricultural techniques. Now that Germany had had 67 years to recover from the Thirty Years' War, industry and commerce were reviving. The Leipziger Messe was the best attended fair in Europe. It surpassed the Frankfurt Fair even in the sale of books. Frankfurt and Hamburg reached, in this century, a degree of mercantile activity equaled only by Paris, Marseille, London, Genoa, Venice, and Constantinople. The merchant princes of Hamburg used their wealth not merely for luxury and display, but for the enthusiastic patronage of opera, poetry, and drama. Here, Handel had his first triumphs. Klopschock found shelter, and Lessing wrote his Hamburgische Dramaturgie, Essays on the Hamburg Beard. The German cities were then, as now, the best administered in Europe. Whereas in France and England the king had succeeded in bringing the nobles into subservience to the central government, the electors, princes, dukes, counts, bishops, or abbots who ruled the German states had deprived the emperor of any real power over their domains and had brought the lower nobility into attendance at princely courts. Aside from the free cities, these courts, residenzen, were the centers of cultural as well as political life in Germany. The wealth of the landowners was drawn to them and was spent in immense palaces, sumptuous expenditure, and magnificent uniforms that, in many cases, were half the man and most of his authority. So Eberhard Ludwig, Duke of Württemberg, commissioned J.F. Netti and Donato Frizzoni to build for him, 1704 through 1733, at Ludwigsburg near Stuttgart, an alternative residence, so lordly in design and decoration, and so complete with elegant furniture and objects of art, as must have cost his subject many thalers and arduous days. The great Schloss or castle at Heidelberg, begun in the 13th century, added in 1751 a cellar vat with a capacity for brewing 49,000 gallons of beer at a time. At Mannheim, Duke Charles Theodore, during his long rule as Elector Palatine from 1733 through 1799, spent 35 million florins on artistic and scientific institutions, museums, libraries, in support of architecture, sculpture, painters, actors, and musicians. Hanover was not large or magnificent, but it had a resplendent opera house, Loring Handel. 
Germany was as mad about music as Mother Italy herself. Munich, too, had a great opera house, financed by a tax on playing cards. But the Duke Electors of Bavaria made their capital famous also for architecture. When his duchy was overrun by Austrians in the War of the Spanish Succession, Maximilian Emmanuel had found refuge in Paris and Versailles. When he returned to Munich in 1714, he brought with him a flair for art and the Rococo style. With him came a young French architect, Francois de Cuvely, who built for the next elector, Charles Albert, in the park of Neifenburg, that masterpiece of German Rococo, the little palace called the Emmelienburg, 1734 through 1739. Simple without, it is a wilderness of ornament within, a domed and dazzling hall of mirrors, Spiegelschlau, with silver stucco carved in lattice work and arabesques, and a yellow room, Gilbsheimer, where the gilt stucco baffles the eye that tries to follow its intricate design. In the same overwhelming style, Joseph Effner began, and Cuvelis completed the Empire Rooms, Reichenheimer, in the ducal residence at Munich. Cuvelis had left France at the age of 20, before acquiring the full discipline of French taste. Unchecked by him, the German artist elaborated the stucco with amateur abandon, achieving retail perfection within gross exaggeration. The Empire Rooms were shattered in the Second World War. Frederick Augustus I, the strong, elector of Saxony, ruled 1694 through 1733, was not to be outdone by any Munchner duke. Despite passing to Warsaw 1697 as King Augustus II of Poland, he found time to tax the Saxons sufficiently to make Dresden, quote, the Florence on the Elbe, end quote, leading all German cities in expenditure on art. The town is the neatest I have seen in Germany, reported Lady Mary Montagu in 1716. Most of the houses are new built. The Elector's Palace is very handsome. Augustus collected pictures almost as avidly as concubines. His son, Elector Frederick Augustus II, ruling 1733 through 63, poured out money on horses and pictures, and, said Winkleman, brought the arts to Germany. In 1734, this younger Augustus sent Algarotti to Italy with ducats to buy paintings. Soon afterward, the elector brought for 100,000 sequins, about half a million dollars, the collection of Duke Francesco III of Modena, and in 1754, he bought Raphael's Sistine Modena for 20,000 ducats, a then unprecedented price. So the great Gamalgari of Dresden took form. A handsome opera house rose in Dresden in 1718, its company must have excelled, for Handel rated it for his English ventures in 1719. And under Johann Hasse, its orchestra was among the best in Europe. It was in Dresden that Miagen Porcelain was born, but that must have a story of its own. In the architecture of the Saxon capital, the great name was Matthias Daniel Poppelmann. For Augustus de Stark, he built in 1711 through 22 the famous Zwinger Palace as a festival concert for the court a brilliant Baroque complex of columns, arches, lovely mullioned windows, balconies, and crowning cupola. The Zwinger was destroyed by bombing in 1945, but the magnificent gate has been rebuilt on the original design. For the same inexhaustible elector, the Roman architect Giattano Chiaverdi raised the Italian Baroque, the Hof Church, or Court Church, 1738 through 51. This too was largely ruined and successfully restored. History is a contest between art and war, and art plays the part of Sisyphus.